You're listening to The Cash Podcast, creating affluence, success, and happiness with your financial surgeon, Adam Coach, president and portfolio manager at Libertas Wealth Management Group at LibertasWealth.com. All right, everyone. Today, we're doing another solo cast so I can share a quick update on the state of the market again. And we're calling this one Coronavirus versus Trump and the Fed. But before we get started, as always, a few housekeeping items. If this is your first time listening or watching, then thanks for joining us. The Cash Podcast is produced weekly, and as stated in the intro, Cash stands for Creating Affluence, Success, and Happiness, and that's our mission. My hope is for you to learn a little bit more each and every episode so that you become more successful, wealthier, happier, and more educated than you were before you started listening today. So come back often and feel free to subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. In addition, you can also follow me on Twitter at Adam Koch and on Instagram at Financial Surgeon. Last but not least, since we're doing a solo cast again this week, and this is a stock market update, please note that all links, visuals, charts, and other educational resources are available on our website if you wanna go check those out. But uh, that's it with the formalities, so let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, Today, um, I'm recording this after the market close, and uh, on Thursday evening, And uh, I've got quite a few things I want to share here today, so let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, First of all, the quote, I always like to start with a quote, I'm a big quote guy, Um, and that is, this is by Sir John Templeton. So he said, the four most dangerous words in investing are, it's different this time. And I think that that's really powerful because I think we all want to think that things are going to be different. And I think in this market, um, if there's one thing that's true, there's been a lot of things that have been different in the short term, but I don't think the long term is going to change uh, Turn out to be all that different in the end. In fact, um, this was posted, uh, I saw it on CNBC. Um, somebody posted it on Twitter. I thought it was hilarious. You know, so you've got bull markets, right? So bull markets are called bull markets because bulls attack with their horns from the bottom up and bears attack with their claws from the top down. So that's why bull markets are good because they're going up, they're up markets, and that's why bear markets are bad. Uh, Somebody said that this is a a new uh, kangaroo market. So now what we have is just a choppy, up and down, crazy, volatile market that is extremely difficult to get through, um, especially if you're paying too much attention to your account. If you're a professional, this is what we do. You know, we look at the market all day, every day. Um, We have calloused minds, as my friend Joe Fami says. Um, But I think that uh, if you're an individual investor or if you're a client of another professional, I think you got to be really careful logging into your account frequently, paying close attention to your statements. Um, I think all that this can do for you is get you maybe a, an ulcer. So let's gonna, we're going to talk about the good evidence today and the bad evidence and then kind of close things out. So the first of all, just a few things about uh, the good evidence here. First and foremost, record-breaking market decline. We've talked about this before. Um, the March 11th low uh, took only 19 trading days to reach a new bear market, which as you can see was the fastest in U.S. history. Never, I mean, not even close. We're talking uh, July 1896, which none of us, no one is alive to have remembered that obviously, 36 days, and that was pretty darn fast. So the fastest bear market in U.S. history, really, really tough uh, to get out much earlier than we did. Now, the next one I want to show you here, this is uh, the fact that we had no recessions in the entire decade of the 2010s. So if you look at the far right over here, you go to the 1950s, we spent 18 months in a recession. The 1960s, 10 months, not so bad. Uh, The 70s, a little bit worse, obviously. 27 months, 22 months in the 80s, only eight months in a recession in the 1990s. Uh, In the stock market, the 1990s, 1998 was pretty rough, 1994. uh, The 2000s, obviously, a really, really rough decade for the market, 26 months in recession um, with only 13 record highs, and that was it. But look at the 2010s. The last decade, we had zero months in a recession. All the market did was give head fakes. It looked like it was going to crash, then it didn't, then it looked like it was going to crash, it didn't, and it just did this over and over and over again. Here's another way of looking at it in a visual. Um, this bar chart just shows you from the 1900s coming forward uh, how many years in each decade the market spent in recession or the economy spent in recession. So in the 1900s, four years, 1910s, four and a half, the 20s, just over four, the 1930s, obviously after the Great Depression, 4.3 years in recession. And since then, since the 40s, the average has definitely dropped off quite a bit. But again, if you look at the 2010s, zero. Um, 
unprecedented in the 2010s and unprecedentedly good, I'll say, in hindsight. Now, in the 2020s, we're starting a new decade here. We're just going to kind of see what happens. But officially, uh, we have now spent just over one month in the first recession we've seen in well over 11 years. Uh, the next thing I want to show you here that's uh, relatively good is uh, pullbacks uh, versus corrections versus cracks, crashes. So pullbacks in the market are defined by drops of call it you know three, four, five, six percent. Um, when you start talking bigger numbers like the market going down from uh, its most recent high, call it uh, ten percent, fourteen percent, sixteen percent, we call that a, a correction. Um, I'm not sure who gets paid to determine what what the breakpoints are in terms of when it's a recession versus a crash. I'm sorry, a correction versus a crash, but um. A crash is defined by a drop of more than uh, 20%. So what we're looking at here are just the difference between pullbacks, corrections off the initial rally lows. So you can see here going all the way back to 1957, the average rally, so the average bounce off the lows, 21.9%. Again, setting records here, March 2020, 44.5% in only 53 days, which is insane. Um, I know I keep using the word unprecedented, but really that's what this has been. Um, you can see here there's some shorter time periods up here, but the average is 30 is the average uh, length of the rally with an average drop afterward of about 10.3%. So what we normally have is a rally, call it a bear market rally of 22%. In an average of 30 days before things head down again for an average of 10%. But instead, what we've seen this year is a ridiculously uh, huge bounce of 44.5% in only 53 days. And then uh, we'll have to see how big the drawdown is. It started already, um, but now I guess that's what the question is. But this is good news, obviously. This is constructive um, and it's somewhat positive. Another piece of good news, well, I'd say good news, but it's, I'd say it's mixed. You can barely see it at the far right here. This is a savings rate, personal savings rate. So I think because of the lockdowns, because of the quarantine, what ended up happening was we had a lot of people staying at home. A lot of people, obviously, were not going out to eat. Um, everybody's stuck at home, so all kinds of savings was thrown in the bank, money markets, credit unions, checking accounts, and so on. And uh, the savings rate went above seven, over 30%, almost 35%, which on the surface sounds great, right? Um, at least for me, I think that people who save, um, people who only spend the money they have, obviously don't want to uh, outspend your means, I think that's a good thing. However, uh, when, you're, when people are saving money, when there's a lot of people saving money, and like this number, this ridiculously high number right here that we're looking at, what that means is they're not spending. And while spending might not be great for all families if they don't have the money especially, uh, not spending's not real good for the economy. So uh, in order for the market to go up, the stock market, in order for there to be uh, GDP growth, uh, growth in our country as, as a productive nation, people need to spend money. So if they don't, then that's where we can run into some supply and demand issues uh, later on down the road as this kind of works itself out. But uh, I, I don't know. I, will, I guess we'll call that mixed. We won't say it's good. We won't say it's bad. But I don't think it's bad per se. Um, and then we have another piece of good news here. 15-year mortgages, 15-year uh, fixed mortgages. This is Charlie Bellello, uh, somebody I follow on Twitter. 2.58%. Um, we're hitting another big low in mortgage rates for people who are looking to buy new homes or people who are looking to refinance their homes. If they have mortgages that are maybe a higher interest and haven't refinanced in years, now now is a good time to kind of look at that. So talk to your mortgage broker. And then last but not least here, something that I think is good, this is obviously kind of nerdy, we're looking at a chart, is while the market bounced and then headed back below its 200-day moving average or this red line, its 200-day trend, and then back above it again, and then it's kind of consolidating sideways or digesting these gains, it's not anywhere near an all-time high, but uh, some constructive evidence down here without getting into the details of what this indicator means, in short, for the nerds out there, um, when the volume of the market, when you take the positive volume minus the negative volume, and then you just create a mathematical chart over time, um, netting out the positive days and the negative days uh, based on volume, you can see here on balance volumes actually already hit an all-time high. And as of yesterday's close, is already still staying above that high. So that's constructive. That's good. Um, we want to see indicators like this leading the market higher, um, not the other way around, leading it lower. So um, for those of you who are listening on iTunes, by the way, please note that all of these charts are 
on uh, our website at libertaswealth.com in the education section. Um, and you can also, if you want to come back to this on YouTube, um, you can always watch this on YouTube as well and see the commentary in real time. So I apologize if you're listening and you can't see the charts, but I'll do my best to talk through it here. So let's change gears and let's talk about the bad evidence. Um, so these are the things that concern me. Uh, first, I can't, we, could, we couldn't have a podcast in the middle of a pandemic without talking about coronavirus. And I apologize, this is so fuzzy, um, but this is the highest quality chart that I could, out, I, I could export here. But um, you can see here, new daily cases in the coronavirus worldwide are upticking, um, as well as the seven-day moving average, or this seven-day trend of coronavirus cases is ticking up. Second of all, while we've had a reducing or, or, or declining trend line in daily deaths due to the coronavirus, right up until about the end of May, beginning of June, it flattened out for a while, and now we're starting to see an uptick in deaths as well. Um, so that's kind of a problem. The next thing here is if we if we step away from the world and we drill down here into the United States specifically, um, the more aggressive states have, have not fared as well. Uh, when I say aggressive states, I mean the, the more aggressively opening states have not fared as well as the more conservative case uh, states. And as you can see here, bottom right, an example of conservative state, New York, obviously, uh, one of the ones that were hit the hardest at the onset. And you can see how the trend in daily cases in New York continues to go down. And that is because they're being extremely slow in reopening um, because they were hit so hard. But when you look at places like uh, California, we've got an uptrend here. Obviously, they're doing more tests. That goes without saying. Um, so I think when we, when we watch the chart of how many deaths are occurring, that's going to be more important than cases. But I do think that we need to pay attention to cases, and I think that that makes sense uh, to use that as a metric that we put on our dashboard. Texas, huge uptick um, this past week. Um, and then Florida, you know, kind of a, redu a reduced trend line here in the number of cases, coronavirus in Florida, then a huge uptick again. So um, those are things that kind of concern me. Another thing having, I don't want to say nothing to do with the coronavirus, but call it as an aftershock or um, a shock wave due to the onset or, or the impact of the coronavirus is the number of bankruptcy filings that are taking place. So in May alone, we had um, the highest number of bankruptcy filings since 2009. Now remember, 2008 and 2009 was a eight, when it, uh, was an 18 month market crash, and the recession, of course, that corresponded with that market crash. But those biggest that biggest number of um, of uh, bankruptcy filings didn't occur till the end of the recession and the end of the crash. So what we're seeing now, this I suppose it's possible this could be flip flopped upside down because of how hard uh, how hard companies were hit. Uh, during the lockdown, but I just I guess I'm just not so sure about that. And the reason I say that is um, we have a lot of companies, several companies that have taken uh, PPP loans, P the payroll protection program loans, who if it weren't for that loan, they wouldn't exist right now. And because they have that loan, it's a forgivable loan in many cases. In other words, they don't have to pay the money back to the government. So if, if they don't have to pay that money back and they use it uh, the way it's supposed to be used with 60% on payroll um, and the other 40% on mortgages, rent, utilities, and health insurance premiums, once that money's gone, which I assume it'll be gone right around probably September or so, it's going to be interesting to see how many com companies have really actually survived through this and how many are, are declaring bankruptcy or filing for bankruptcy as we see here. So watching this number in June... July and so on is going to be, I think, really interesting. Um, another one here from Charlie Belillo. Uh, this is concerning to me as well long term, not so much short term, but long term. The amount of debt we have in this country has now exploded as a result of all the stimulus that's going on to 121% of gross domestic product. So in other words, what that means is the amount of debt we have as a country is 21% higher than what we actually produce in this country. And that's kind of like the equivalent to a, a family spending more money than they have. So we have more debt, and as long as interest rates stay low, we're maybe okay to carry that debt. But if interest rates start to head higher, that could be a huge problem. Um, when you hear people talk about the debt and or the national debt and how your your grandparents, or, or I'm sorry, your grandkids, and I think somebody said this the other day, said your great-grandkids now are gonna have to pay for this. This is the chart that we're looking at, is how does the debt compare to uh, the percentage of uh, GDP and, and nominal GDP, the, the things we produce in this country and export. So this is a big problem. Um, but again, long term, 
The next thing I want to show you here is the average recession length since World War II. So you can see here the length of expansion, 128 months. This was one of the longest, I think actually the longest economic expansion in U.S. history from July 2009 until February of this year. So huge long expansion where the GDP grew at 50%. The question now is, how long is the recession going to last? We're about a month and a half, just over a month and a half in to this current recession. The average recession lasts 11 months. Markets typically bottom, by the way, before recessions end. Uh, so keep that in mind. However, I think it's important to realize that there's a range, if we go back to World War II, of you know 18 months being the long and uh, you know, six months being a short recession. And we're sitting about one and a half months in. So again, something to watch, something to keep in mind. Sorry about that. Um, got ahead of myself here. So the next one is the average recession length in world, since World War II. So again, we said we're one, one and a half months into this recession. The average is 11. Um, the average GDP is a loss of 2% uh, in the average recession. The question then becomes, how long is the next expansion going to be once this recession's over? Well, that's uh, who knows how long it's going to take to get there, but the average expansion is 64 months. Again, this last expansion was 128 months long. Next thing I want to show you, just a couple things for the nerds out there. Um, we we have, a, again, the S&P 500 digesting its gains. Uh, something that is concerning more, me, though, is a, um, a crossover, a negative crossover in what's called the Moving Average Convergence Divergence Indicator. It's a momentum indicator. Um, it crossed negatively here once, then positively again almost right away, and now we're seeing a second cross negatively at new highs. That's somewhat concerning. Um, again, a, just a piece of negative evidence that I'm paying attention to as the market moves forward on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, next kind of uh, nerds chart to share with you is that the percentage of stocks above the 200-day moving average is a metric that I like to follow because to me, if you look at the market like a doctor's patient, this tells me what the vital signs are underneath the market. Now, I use six others that are a lot more complicated, but this one's the, th these three, I should say, are the easiest to explain. So what you're looking at here in the upper pane is a, is a chart of the S&P 500. And then in the first middle pane here, what we're looking at is the percentage of stocks trading above their 200-day moving average. If I go back back one slide here. Uh, the 200-day moving average is this red line. So it's the percentage of stocks inside the stock market that are trading above that long-term trend line. And what we want, obviously, is to see lots of stocks trading above that long-term trend line, which indicates a healthy market. So what we saw this past couple weeks is that we traded above 60%, which is good. When I when I when when we get above 60%, I like to call that field goal range because think of 60, the inverse of 60 is 40. It's like we're on the 40-yard line and we're close enough to kick a field goal, maybe start putting some points on the board and playing some offense. But Thursday's sell-off alone caused it to drop right back below uh, 40, putting us back on defense, and we got to be really, really conservative here. And the reason for being conservative is because right now, as of yesterday's close, the, the, there is only 41% of stocks on the S&P 500 trading above their 200-day trend line or 200-day moving average. But if you go deeper and you say mid-cap stocks, so, so mid-sized companies, uh, only 32% of them are trading above their uh, long-term trend line. And then if you look at small caps, it's even worse. So uh, the small cap 600 or the 600 stocks in the small cap index, only 29% of those stocks are trading above their 200-day moving average. And I was on the phone today with a Wall Street Journal, Journal reporter, um, and I was trying to explain this concept of um, the, the generals and the troops. And um, what, that, what I mean by that is when you look at the S&P 500 or the Dow, those big, huge companies that lead the index, those are like the generals. Those are the, the, uh, the people who kind of lead their troops into battle. The troops are the mid-cap stocks and the small-cap stocks. And if you're charging ahead as a general or the generals and you're going into battle, you want your troops to be with you. And what, when I look at these, in, call it vital signs, like I said earlier, and these internal indicators that tell me the internal strength or internal health of the market, and I see that only 29% of my troops on the small cap index are sitting back at base camp um, or that 32% of my, my mid-size companies, my mid, mid caps are sitting back at base camp while the generals are just driving into battle, that's kind of a problem. So we wanna make sure in, in, in order for there to be a healthy market, we wanna see more stocks on the market participating 
in the upside. So think of it like a participation index here. Um, so sorry if that was a little bit nerdy. Again, if you want to see the chart, it's on our website. It'll be on the podcast page. And then next, the last couple charts I'm going to show you here today, um, this is the, what you're looking at here, or if you're listening, what I'm showing uh, viewers on YouTube is the uh, monthly chart of the S&P 500 with the 10-month moving average or the 10-month trend in red here. And every time you see a shaded area, what you're looking at is when the whenever the market on a monthly basis closed below that 10 month moving average. And whenever that happens, that's bad. Um, uh, Med Faber made this famous. Um, this is a very popular indicator for trend followers. A lot of people follow it. And when it's below this, when you're below this uh, red line, you generally want to be on defense, if, if, if long term that is. And now every every investor doesn't use this, every trend follower doesn't use this as a, as a Bible, so to speak. But you can see here, going back to 2015, you go below it, you sell down here, and then all of a sudden you buy up here. So it's called a whipsaw or a head fake. Then you, then you sell down here, and then you have to buy higher again. Now we've got a nice trend in 2017. 2018 was a little rough in the beginning, but look, as 2018 goes along here on this chart, we sell in, uh, call it late in the year, if we use this indicator alone by itself, then we buy higher. Then we sell lower, then we buy higher. Then we sell lower, and then we buy higher, and this is all in the in the course of one year. Now, this is not what we did at our office. Um, my uh, I use I use more indicators than this, kind of like some of the things I've been showing you. Um, but my point, I guess, is that we closed below that ten month moving average, and now we're right back above it again. And the question right now, the big long term question is, is this just another whipsaw or just another head fake, or is this the real thing? And I guess it's just going to kind of take some time uh, to wash things out and see what happens. For me, the uh, RSI momentum down here, lower highs in the RSI with higher highs in price, that's called a negative divergence. Unless this line right down here in the bottom right is able to break north of that declining trend line that I've drawn, to me, this negative evidence is still very much on the table long term, but this is a monthly chart. Every candlestick is one month, so this is this is a long-term chart. We could see new highs before this thing actually resolves to the downside, but for now, that is the big question is, are we going to head sideways, are we going to head lower, or are we going to see new highs in the near future? And the reason why this uh, monthly chart is so meaningful, by the way, as, again, not a one-and-done indicator, but as a piece of evidence to keep in mind when managing your portfolio, and by the way, this can be looked at as one of the pieces of positive evidence that I was mentioning earlier, um, because again, this is not negative to see the 10 month move or the market trading above its 10 month moving average. But the reason why I really like this as uh, a piece of evidence is because you look back in time at 2000, 2001, 2002, you can see that negative divergence I was talking about and momentum in the lower pane of the chart here. But then you can see the lower uh, divergence kind of gives us a warning sign. And then we miss a good chunk of the decline here in 2000, 2001, 2002. Got a little head fake here in 2006. I'm sorry, 2004. And then we got another shorter divergence, but a short-term divergence in 2007. Then again, this indicator would have helped us avoid a good chunk of the downside in 2007, 8, and 9. Since then, a couple whipsaws, one in 2010, another big one in 2012. Um, I mentioned the uh, nasty two whipsaws in 2015 and 16. That was a really rough 20 month period. And then it's pretty much 20, uh, 2018, 2019 have been really rough if you lose use this all on its own. But that's why it's so important to use multiple indicators, multiple pieces of evidence, and really treat the market like a crime scene and a voting mechanism to say, okay, let's look at all the good things. Let's look at all the bad things. Let's combine them together and create a weight of the evidence approach to is this market in a bullish regime? In other words, a good place, a healthy place, or is it in an unhealthy place? For me, where I'm at, um, I think that the weight, of, the weight of the evidence is still slightly negative. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm cup half full, but I'm not. But the cup is not full. So I'm cautiously optimistic. But um, our, our aggressive portfolio, we've got some chips on the table. We've got a few chips on the table in our moderate growth portfolio, but we're still being very conservative, sticking to money market uh, and bonds in our more conservative models. The risk of a short-term sell-off in stocks, I think, is still high in the short term, but the market is still digesting gains, meaning it's still kind of trying to digest the sellers and the buyers. They're having this battle, the bulls and the bears, and we have to figure out what does the market want to do? Does it want to head higher and buck the trend of the coronavirus and just 
shoot northward from here or um, are we going to have some more problems? And this leads us to Trump. Um, Trump wants to win this election. He's made the stock market his barometer for success the entire four, call it three and a half years, a little bit more, that he's been in office. So in order for him to get elected by his own accord, he needs the stock market to go up, which is, I guess, I don't want to call it a positive piece of evidence. There's nothing to do with politics, uh, whether you're left, whether you're right, Democrat, Democrat or Republican. But the fact of the matter is any president, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or if an independent ever gets elected in office, they all want to win elections. So since he's made the market his barometer, he wants the market to go up. And things like uh, proposing the infrastructure stimulus bill that he did this week are examples of that. A $1 million infrastructure bill a stimulus package to help uh, put people to work for bro roads, bridges, um, that would obviously help the economy. Um, and I think the same goes for the Fed. I think that there might be pressure on the Fed to keep printing money, to keep doing stimulus, um, because the president appoints the, the chairman of the Fed, and that's Jerome Powell. And uh, if he doesn't push uh, more money in the market, there's always that chance. You got to wonder. I don't know if this is the case for sure, but you got to wonder, okay, if uh, if I'm Jerome Powell and my president, who's basically my boss, says, look, hey, you know, keep pushing the market up for me uh, by pumping money in into the market, giving money to the hands of investors or the banks and repo, uh, overnight repo auctions. Um, I think that uh, there's a chance that, that that could be happening behind the scenes. So I think that there's a lot of uh, things going on, a battle behind the scenes. You know, the coronavirus, obviously, the the, the uh, virus itself perhaps coming back could be a problem. Um, but if between now and the election, there is some bullish evidence, just not only on the charts and the news I've shared with you, but um, just with what happens in any election year. Uh, so the, And then the money is in the hands of the people this time. When we look at stimulus packages like the uh, the boost in unemployment benefits, the extra $600 a week or $2,400 a month, um, during 2007, 8, and 9, all, a lot of the stimulus that was given out was given to banks, and banks used that money to recapitalize um, and build back up what they'd lost through all those uh, poor mortgages that they'd written. Whereas this time, you know, a lot of money's been given to investors through uh, unemployment. And another a ton of money has been given to business owners, small business owners through the PPP loan. And I already spoke to that earlier, but my question becomes at the bottom here, what happens when that extra $2,400 a month or $600 a week above and beyond the normal unemployment that uh, individuals have been getting? What happens when that money runs out at the end of July, by the way, is when that happens? Um, what happens when the PPP loan runs out, runs out for the business owners? Like I said earlier, that's probably going to happen somewhere around September. Um, how many companies are going to be left when that's all over with? And then uh, the other thing to keep in mind is, and I'm sure we all, you've probably been thinking about this if you're listening, if you're watching, is how many furloughed employees end up getting laid off in the end? Or how many people who've been temporarily laid off end up becoming permanently laid off in the end? And if we talk about that personal savings rate and how high that savings rate has gotten, while that might be good for a family to have an emergency account to save, which, by the way, people should be doing this time. If this wasn't a lesson uh, to any of you who didn't have an emergency account saved up beforehand, I think that hopefully you're you're learning now. You got to have you know three six months of your expenses sitting in a savings account in case you lose your job, and this is exactly why. But while that savings rate is high, and while that's good for individuals and families, the concern here is is if there's less people employed. If there's less businesses in existence, uh, there's less people spending money and more people saving money, that means that the economy is going to struggle as a result. So we're just going to have to see what happens, but um, that's all we're going to talk about today. If you would... Uh, like to discuss your personal situation further, remember you never have to be a client to ask a question. So please head over to our website to get more information uh, to reach out to us privately if you're interested in talking. Um, but that's it for today's episode. We realize that there are thousands of podcasts out there and you chose to listen to ours. So thank you so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. Feel free to share the podcast that you just saw or, um, on YouTube or heard with your friends. Um, and if you want any more educational information, um, I write articles, screencasts, videos we have um, on a regular basis at LibertasWealth.com. Again, as I said earlier, you can also follow me on Twitter at Adam Koch, as well as on Instagram at Financial Surgeons. So thank you so much for joining us again, and we will see you next time. 
Thank you for listening to The Cash Podcast with your financial surgeon, Adam Koch. To see any charts or images that were mentioned in this show or to check out additional articles, videos, and other educational resources, head over to LibertasWealth.com.